And now on the Business Radio X Network, another exciting episode with Jamie Erbatev in Connecting Tucson with Jamie. Hello, and welcome to Connecting Tucson with Jamie Overturf, where we focus on connecting our community and local businesses here in Tucson. Today, we are broadcasting from Tucson Business Radio X, which is situated in the Stewart Title Corporate Offices off of Broadway. And we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Jason Moyle. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy you could come. Appreciate that. Uh, Jason comes to us today uh, as a doctor of a chiropractic medicine, and he is owning his own business and practice right here in Tucson, up in the Northwest area, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, you are a transplant from Iowa. Correct. But we're so not going to hold that against you. <laughs> um, you've gone from Iowa farmlands, but you also were in the Air Force. Yes, that is correct. I was active duty for four years. Okay. And stationed here at davis Mothin in Tucson. Nice. Okay. So you were married to uh, your wonderful wife of 18 years, Sylvia. Correct. Yep. And you have two beautiful children, Liv, who is age eight, and Isaac, who is age 11, correct? Yes. All right. So let's just jump right in. So you went from farmland to Air Force to chiropractor. That seems like a really smooth transition. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> I would like to say it was all part of the plan, but it just kind of, as most people's life, I would say it, it kind of happens you you dive into something get some experience realize you don't like certain things realize you do like other things and that's kind of how it goes i started off i wanted to play college basketball i did play for a year uh, back at a small school in iowa i uh, didn't really know what i wanted to do school wise just was kind of the typical jock back then you know i did enough to stay eligible to play sports but <laughs> didn't uh didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And a lot of my family went to the military. That's kind of the route that I decided to do. That's where the Air Force came in? Yep, that's where the Air Force came in. I think I grew up a lot in the Air Force, kind of figured out what I liked, what I didn't like. Hurt my back in the Air Force, went to a chiropractor. He helped me. Oh, that's and then that the, light kind of came on that yeah, you get like yeah. that. Oh, and no. I never really wanted to be a, a medical doctor per se, because I didn't want to deal with the, the messiness of it. You know, I wasn't involved. I didn't want to do a surgery, nothing like no that. No blood, no gore. Correct. Yeah, the liquids that are involved. Was not a big fan <laughs> of that. And I've always been more like holistic, generally speaking. Okay. Um, so chiropractic just seemed like a good fit. I never went to one before that or anything, but one thing led to the, the next. So the transition that I'm really hearing is that while you were in the Air Force, you were injured, correct? Correct. So you had to go see a chiropractor. Correct, yep. And that's kind of where it led you into... How, how, so you you seen a chiropractor. How did from seeing a chiropractor to becoming a chiropractor actually take place? Well, I, start, I was curious in the body. I realized that I was smarter than I believed I was. I, I didn't put a whole lot of effort into school in high school. But when I was in the military, they teach you a lot about discipline, obviously. And I started doing well. Uh, graduated with honors from my tech school, all that kind of stuff. So kind of a light bulb went on that, hey, if I really apply myself to this, you know, mm -hmm. I'd always applied myself to basketball and sports and done well, but not so much academically. Um, so you seem to get that later on in life that yeah. when you apply yourself more in school, you actually, are actually smarter than you think you are. You, yeah. you get that a lot. And I'm when you care about something that you, you know, yeah, exactly. so many kids go to school and don't have no idea what they want to do and they end up in debt and Exactly. Don't use the degree that they have, that kind of a thing. So, or they don't have a degree that can get them where they right. want to go. So now they're backtracking. Absolutely. So that's I've always told my son. You know, you just take your time. You're 16. You don't know what you're gonna. You you don't know what you want to do. Right. Just you know, live your life, have some fun, mm -hmm. do new experiences, and if something piques your interest, let's Absolutely. go that. Absolutely. And in fact. I know this is off the subject, but, you know, my son's, I'm really interested into that crime scene stuff. And I find that the school he goes to actually has one of those classes. It's like a crime scene investigation class okay, yeah, that you cool. can take a science. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, so that's what he's doing yeah. this year as a junior. So hopefully he can get a little bit more interested in science. He wasn't interested in dissecting frogs. Just, right. So I know he's not going the doctor yeah. route. <laughs> It's usually how it goes. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, it's one of those things, you know, you, it, you're so right. When you finally find something that you're interested in, the light bulb goes off and you become more invested in that. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's good. So obviously, you know, being injured and seeing your chiropractor was a way that helped you. And um, obviously it was helping. You had a, a desire to maybe want to help others as well. Is that how that came about? Or yes. you said, okay. That's what happened. I saw this chiropractor. That's what I want to do. 
Pretty much in a nutshell. I mean, I, it helped me immensely and quickly. You know, like I said, I never, we were never like a super holistic family, but it, we didn't really go to the doctor more, more just because we couldn't <laughs> afford it. Probably more than anything. It was just, you Who know, can? Rub some, just be... yeah, rub some dirt on it and keep going. Cause I grew up, you Robitussin. know, farm. Robitussin for everything. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember my mom giving me a hot toddy when I was sick and all that kind of stuff. So that's a, a I wish my school. mom would, Hey mom, <laughs> see hot toddies do work. You could have given me one. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. So it, it worked. It helped me out. Got me back in the game. You know, I still played basketball through the air force on the base team. So I was still pretty active and helped me out really quickly. And then the doctor there took an interest too and kind of asked me about it, thought I'd be a good candidate for whatever reason. I have no idea. That helps. Maybe a mentor type. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I kind of bounced back and forth because I was going to teach and coach too. That was always kind of in my heart to be like a high school teacher, basketball coach, that kind of a thing. So I kind of bounced back and forth between those two for a long time and then just finally settled on going to chiropractic college. Nice. Well, when I think of chiropractor, like the snap, crackle, pop, rice, crispy treats come to mind. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, part of it, that's, I get that a lot. <laughs> so, but I'm sure there is more to it, as you just say. So what is a chiropractor and what exactly do you do? Oh, man, that's a big I know, question. I know right that's there. a big loaded question. And, you know, there's some people that have preconceived notions right, out right. there. So that's kind of what I was going to talk about. Yeah. So bit, why yeah. don't you tell what what do you do? What what does chiropr- what is chiropractic medicine to you? Well, to me, I would say it's it is more about pain and overall function. So, you know, my story was grew up playing tons of sports, had a lot of little nagging injuries. Mm -hmm. Um, Through my education, I realized those nagging injuries and through personal experience, those nagging injuries become bigger problems down the road unless they're really fixed. Um, Now, fixed is kind of a loaded word because it's you're never really broken or fixed. You're always kind of fluctuating, you know, to 100 percent function versus being hurt all the time, that kind of a thing. Um, So to me, it's more about identifying, you know, the main problems um, seeing where you're dysfunctional in in English, that means, you know, joints that are moving the way they're supposed to, muscles doing their job the way they're supposed to, all that kind of a thing. Um, the actual adjustment itself is just in a simplest form, finding joints that aren't moving the way they're supposed to and getting them to move better. You know, there's there's other ways of doing it, like a simple stretch or mobilization techniques. But what the traditional adjustment is, is like what you were saying, the, you hear the popping noise, all that kind of stuff. And all that is, the is rice just, crispy treats. Yeah, exactly. People get all kinds of ideas about that. And it sounds, some people love it. Some people can't stand it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's quite a difference between the two types of patients. You know, some people are scared to death when they come in. Some people are like, oh, the more noise, the better, you know, that kind of a thing. So, um, so do you always ask, do you like the noise or do you not like the noise? Is that, is like the precursor? I don't precursor? ask it in that word, but I, I, I probably could use those words, but I, I do ask them, you know, how they've had an adjustment before just to, because there's lots of different variability. Like you said, there's a lot of uh, preconceived notions about chiropractic. And that's one of them is that there's lots of different experiences. You know, you could go to 20 chiropractors and have 20 different experiences, whereas medicine is more standardized. So that's, right. I think, where some of the confusion comes in. For so sure. there is some popping with the adjustment, but, mm-hmm. you know, obviously there there's other things too. You, you, you mentioned manipulation mm-hmm. or stretching. You have some contraptions that look kind of weird in your office, <laughs> right. but they all have a purpose. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. The bottom line is trying to get movement where there's not movement. And then we also try to give corrective exercises for places that need strengthening, that kind of a thing. So you you give your patients homework? Absolutely, yep. Okay. I'm a big proponent of making them self-sufficient, not reliant on me all the time. You know, I feel like as a a good doctor, that's their job is to make patients more uh, independent, you know, going down the road. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Now, you mentioned, you know, you you went to chiropractic college. Obviously, there's got to be some type of specialized training. What does it take to become a chiropractor? What did you have to do? Typically, you go to school for, you don't actually need, as when I went to school, it may be different now, you don't need a bachelor's degree to get into chiropractic college. We needed uh, basically three years of undergrad, and then you could finish your fourth year to get your bachelor's degree. Uh, in conjunction with getting your doctorate. So I basically, my first year of chiropractic college was the first year of my doctorate and the last year of my bachelor's degree. So basically a four-year degree and then chiropractic college is another, it's three uh, It's three calendar years. So we go nonstop for three years. We have three semesters per year instead of two. Oh. So if you broke it down into traditional, it's five extra years of school. 
But you just but, went nonstop without correct. the break in between like normal colleges exactly. have for like summer break. Exactly. Yep. So, so it's it's the equivalent of eight total years, you know, if you get your bachelor's and then chiropractic college together, basically. Right. And so. you study certain classes, I'm assuming, like body analogy. Yep. Or? It's very similar to med school. I, I would say the, the difference is that we don't learn about pharmacology because we don't prescribe medicine. Nothing I was like going to say, what is pharmacology? <laughs> yep. Drugs and, you know, that kind of medications, all that kind of stuff. But as far as like the basic sciences, anatomy, physiology, um, radiology, we actually have more radiology than the typical medical doctor. Most MDs will go and specialize in radiology after med school, that kind of a thing. But just in the base medical school versus chiropractic college, um, we get quite a bit of radiology because we, you know, treat the musculoskeletal system quite a bit. Right. Um, you're you're that's what you see day in and day out. Exactly. Yep. So it's just. The basic sciences are pretty similar, but we differ be based on the, the tools and the treatments that we offer. You know, we're more similar to physical therapists now. You know, they don't have as much. So I've had the pleasure of being in your office. I've seen some tools that are actually remind or reminiscent of physical therapy. Do you mm -hmm. also do physical therapy in your office or I, I, are those just the tools to help get the movement going? It's more tools. It's more of a side tool, I guess, for chiropractors, because we're not physical therapists. I don't want to portray myself as a physical therapist, because mm -hmm. our schooling is slightly different. I think, my personal opinion is I think the two together offer the best solutions for most, you know, musculoskeletal type problems, neck and back pain, that kind of a thing. Um, but there is very much a crossover between the two professions, for sure. So working hand in hand, they work together. Absolutely. So do you have a couple of physical therapists that you work with or that you recommend that you would, you know, pair up with? Do you usually have those for your patients? We do. I'm big on referring, you know, if I don't have the tools to help somebody and you know, I'm big on getting people to the right places. Sometimes it's a matter of me trying, you know, for a week or two. And if we're not, if we're not at least moving in the right direction pretty quickly, then we'll get them to whether it's a uh, orthopedic surgeon or a physical therapist, whoever the case is, you know, whatever. And I would really try to, to go out of my way to identify who's going to help them the best. Cause I know a lot of patients struggle with that. Just not knowing it's so overwhelming sometimes to, to know who to go to and you could end up paying a copay to five different people and still not be in the right place. So if we can guide them, if I can help them and we can guide them to the most effective person to save them hopefully some time and money, then and that's, that's extremely a, helpful in any goal. book that's out there. Yeah. So is your training ever really done? Do you ever do continuing education with all of the new tools and technology and, you know, things that are out there? I would think that there would be some type of, mm -hmm. you know, continuing education for your type of profession. Absolutely. I mean, it's required. There's 12, oh, okay. 12 hours are required um, per year, and that's to maintain your license. Um, I'm, you know, my wife will tell you I'm a pretty big nerd when it comes to, it's funny because I was not this <laughs> way in high school. I was not. The, you portrayed yourself as a jock in yeah, high school and yeah. now you're a nerd. Okay. Now I am very much because I read constantly and uh, I'm always taking classes. Um, a what's a little bit different about my practice as far as um, the physical therapy side of things is of taking extra certifications from functional movement systems. Um, there's a guy named Greg Cook. He's a physical therapist, pretty well known in that kind of world. And there's a certification called the Selective Functional Movement Assessment. And okay. that's kind of an ongoing, it's, it's a way to look at the body on how people are moving. Because most problems come from, you know, we just don't move. We, either we don't move enough or we move poorly when we do move and we end up getting ourselves hurt. So I'm constantly reading things, taking certifications, that kind of stuff. Just because I'm interested in one thing, but it, it also, I don't think we ever know enough to, to help everyone. So I'm try, trying to to just sharpen my tools and put more tools in my toolbox, that kind of thing. Got it. So yeah. your patients are in good hands. I, I'd like to believe so. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> He's not over there laughing. He should be, though. <laughs> so all jokes aside, and oops, 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 we have a guest on the table. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Looks like a lightning bug. Um, all my jokes aside and out of the system, um, I've spoken to a lot of patients of chiropractic doctors and you had mentioned this they're not really standardized and I have mixed mm -hmm. reviews when it comes to you know oh I had a good experience at a chiropractor I had a bad experience at a, at a chiropractor um what what do you think stems from that what do you think would the mixed review stem from I think some of it I mean it's a this you could talk about this for two hours it's I been know, kind of right? a long-standing 
I guess, battle, so to speak. I mean, chiropractic is relatively new. It's been an organized profession since I think 1895 was like the first official um, adjustment, even though bone setting stuff that we do has been around a long time. It hasn't really been a, a named profession for all that long, for a little over 100 years now. And when it first came out, it was very similar to um, like doctors of osteopath. It was the manipulation is, it, or the, the chiropractic adjustment, that's what we call that, is, is a manipulation, mm -hmm. is um, getting proper spinal alignment, things like that can affect multiple things, you know, like overall health and well-being, that kind of a thing. So I think there's been controversy in that. And some chiropractors have, have really been adamant about, you know, chiropractic adjustments can help everything from asthma to ADHD and all these kinds of things, which there's anecdotal evidence, you know, basically a guy gave an adjustment and his ADHD seemed to improve, you know, but that's not evidence of it being cause and effect, that kind of a thing. So there can be people taking that to the extremes, you know, and making claims that are not necessarily substantiated. And that's the position that I take is that it's very substantiated that we can help with back and neck pain, um, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, I do believe overall spinal health can impact your overall health, but to say, you know, that we can treat ADHD and things like that, that's where I think some chiropractors get themselves in trouble. Take it to the extreme Correct. and trying to... And believing, you know, everybody should be adjusted multiple times a month, that kind of thing. I don't necessarily agree with that. Everybody's different. Um, you know, there's not a one tool that affects and fixes everything, so... Every patient is different, Absolutely. so... And, and speaking of patients, you know, every patient is different. Not When I think of a typical chiropractic visit, um, I think someone had to have been in an accident prior to coming to you, but that's not always the case. You you have clients coming to you for many reasons. Correct, yep. Um, what are some of the reasons that somebody might want to visit a chiropractor or think about, you know, hey, this has been, you know, why should someone think about seeing a chiropractor? Absolutely. Uh, it's actually more common for people to come up and say, hey, have this low back's been bothering me for two months and I have no idea why. You know, it's really I see more of those people than, you know, car accidents or my practice is not a big personal injury practice. I do see some of those for sure. Um, and, and the injury is obvious there, you know, you fell, you hurt yourself or you got hit by somebody or I sprained my ankle playing basketball, that kind of a thing. But I would say the vast majority are, you know, office workers or construction workers, um, all kinds of different types of jobs that it's more chronic pain and it's finally at a level that they're going to do something about it. So, you know, a typical case is a construction worker that has kind of some low level back pain, but you know, who doesn't at the, over the age of 40, that's been, you know, using their body that much to that degree. I'm raising my hand. You can't see me, but I'm raising my hand. <laughs> so, and then it finally gets to a point, they deal with it for so long and it gets to a point where they, they can't do their job effectively or they can't play with their kids, that kind of a thing. And that's, that's the typical case that comes in. Well, they, they're guarding it almost where the point that they're just kind of limiting their movement, which actually hurts them because they're not doing the full range of Correct. motion. Yep, absolutely. I've learned this because you're a great doctor and <laughs> <laughs> you've helped, but right. yes, you know, I, I was doing a lot of guarding with my neck. So yep. that was one of them that are there. And pain. One thing I'll say is that pain leads to other problems too. Anytime there's pain in the body, you can't, you can push through it to a degree but your body reflexively will change to adapt to it. And that can cause problems, you know, maybe a month from now, maybe five years from now, but it, it usually will change things down the road too. And that's kind of where the movement assessment comes in. And that's why I did that is, is you can really identify how poorly people are moving and predict based on that of where they're going to have issues, you know, really common, so common problems would be like ankle, like basketball players going back to my story. I broke my ankle, sprained them tons of times. And over the years, I kept having low back pain. And then through learning and all that, I realized most people with ankle injuries have hip issues. And when your hip is asymmetrical, meaning one side's a lot tighter than the other, it's a big predictor of low back pain. So people yeah. come in with low back pain, but really their problem probably started 10 years ago playing high school basketball when they kept spraining their ankles, that kind of a thing. So, so um, Brittany's going to be upset that I'm probably talking about her here, but my office manager, Brittany, right. was actually in a really severe car accident where she shattered her ankle yeah. and she has limited movement mm -hmm. and she does have lower back pain. My guess is that's probably where it's stemming from good, some of that. Good chance for sure. Good yeah. chance that's yeah. there. When you take it, I mean, I can't take credit for this. Greg Cook is the guy that kind of came up with the joint. He calls it the joint by joint concept of, Joints take turns, you know, from mobile to stable. 
when when one of those gets out of whack, like your ankle, it's it should be a very mobile joint. It, it makes becomes very good stiff, sense, though. Then the joints above it have to kind of reverse that order too, and that's usually what happens. So like your ankle should be mobile, your knee should be pretty stable, your hips should be mobile, your low back should be very stable. Like a lot of people do tons of crunches and setups that just they make your abs strong, give you a six pack, but they'll probably hurt your back eventually. So getting those in the yeah. proper order will generally help things out long term. All right. Yeah. That is so interesting. So this actually leads me to one of my next questions as we're talking about, you know, these joints and moving. Um, and I'm sure not everybody here or listening has been to a chiropractor, understands what a chiropractor actually does. Let's say they're coming to you for the first time. Mm -hmm. What would that first visit look like for them? Okay. So it's pretty standard at consultation. Consultation is just an interview, kind of like what you and I are doing here. Just ask them a lot about their history, um, old injuries, you know, the particular problem that they're coming up in with, that kind of a thing. What have they done for it? Have they gone to other doctors? Have they gotten x-rays? All that kind of stuff. We try to be really, really thorough in that first interview to understand kind of, you know, what that person does day to day, what issues they've had, trying to basically put the, the case together of, you know, what's going on with that particular person. And then the next step is to do an examination. Chiropractic exam is, is fairly standard. Um, it's pretty similar to what you'd have done at an orthopedic surgeon's office or a physical therapist's office, because we all learn the same orthopedic test, neurological test, all that kind of stuff. It's, there's not really a special chiropractic um, exam per se. Okay. There's a few extra things that we'll do as chiropractors because we primarily work with our hands and what we call that is palpation. It, it basically just means we're putting our hands on them to see how um, joints are moving, things like that. And then the, the extra part of what we do is, is what's called the selective functional movement assessment through FMS. And that's basically just taking you through a standardized movement process and then scoring you, you know, can you do this? Can you not do this? Does it hurt? That kind of a thing. And that helps us identify the corrective exercise component of things more. Um, but that's typically the process. Usually a first visit will take about an hour. You know, we spend about an hour at the patient that first time to really get to understand them, identify what those problem areas are, and then let them know, you know, this is what I see. Um, this is what I think I can do or I can't do. And if I can't do something, I think you should see this person, that kind of a thing. Do you actually do an adjustment that first time? Most often, yes. There's cases where if somebody has some neurological issues, um, things that are more significant, we'll refer them out typically to get, either get an x-ray or an MRI. Um, because neurology is is the more significant. If if that's, and what I mean by that is, you know, pain shooting down legs, arms, things going numb, tingly, all that kind of stuff. That Those are indicators that there's some kind of neurological tissue that's that's irritated in there. And that's more significant. We can still potentially help that, but we want to make sure we're really clear on what's going on and if if they should get to somebody um, that can do more about it more quickly, then we want to do that okay. right away. But but typically we'll adjust the first visit. Typically. So first visit's not scary. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if every patient is. It's true. And I mean, there, we talked, to, we touched a little bit about this. You know, there are several misconceptions about chiropractors. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the misconceptions that you see day in and day out? Well, I think one that's common is um, you probably heard once you go to a chiropractor, you have to go for the rest of your life. That's, that's a common one. And, and I think where that comes from, um, there are you know, negative connotations and positive to that, I would say. Mm -hmm. On the negative side, there are, there definitely are, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it, bad chiropractors, like there's bad everything else, you know, mm -hmm. there's bad medical yep. doctors out there too that are, their interests are not in the patient's best interest necessarily always, you know, it's more of a, a business consideration. I think that's rare, luckily. Um, the positive side of it is that there are people that, that do generally need to come in for more kind of maintenance care, that kind of a thing. People that have chronic, you know, arthritis, um, people that have had bad, bad injuries, you can't really fix the problem, but you can kind of help manage it Alleviate over time. It. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I try to really make that clear of like why this is the case. Cause it's not the case for everybody. If somebody's in good shape, they're taking care of themselves. I don't necessarily need to think they need to come in, you know, on a maintenance basis per se. Um, some people just like to check in, you know, every six months or so just to say, Hey, you know, say hi, get adjusted, that kind of a thing if they need it. Um, but there's definitely cases where, you know, the guy's got no disc in his back and he's got 
chronic arthritis and you're not going to fix that problem. But if you can keep movement in there, it'll do them some good. So exactly. So, so it yeah. doesn't get stiff and correct. Yeah. So, but there's, there's definitely chiropractors out there that believe that, you know, everybody should be adjusted, you know, once a week, the rest of their life, that kind of a thing. And I don't necessarily, I think that's where the negative connotation comes from probably. So how do you specifically, you, you obviously you're out and about, you tell somebody you're a chiropractor, how do you mm -hmm. overcome those negative connotations? I generally, I don't try too hard. I, I feel like if I'm trying to, you know, answer, I, I don't want to ever come across like I'm trying to really sell anybody on it. You know, I just say, Hey, it's, I try to keep it simple. I'm, you know, like I said, a country boy from Iowa, I try to keep <laughs> things pretty transparent and say, Hey, come in, we'll ask some questions, do an exam. If I feel like I can help you, I'll tell you if I feel like I can't, I won't, you know, and, and more about the ongoing care kind of thing. I'll tell people what I think and let them know that the ball's always in their court, you know, because what we're doing is not, you know, we're not curing cancer. We're not, you know, doing heart <laughs> transplants. Do I believe somebody will benefit from what we're doing most often? Yes. But do I, you know, they're not going to die if they don't come to a chiropractor and nothing like that. It's, it's totally their choice. Um, especially after we get them out of pain, I always tell them, you know, that if, if I do feel like they're a candidate for ongoing care, I'll tell them that and say, Hey, you know, it's probably a good idea. You know, we're not going to make you feel perfect, but I think it'll help you down the road. Or I may tell them, um, that to just call in as needed, that kind of a thing. And it's always their choice when it gets to that, to that point. I like it. I yeah. like it a lot. So that being said, what products and services do you offer? Well, the, the main thing, the bread and butter is the chiropractic adjustment. That's the <laughs> main thing that we, you know, are taught to do. And okay. I think that's probably what differentiates chiropractors from, from most others. There are some physical therapists, some osteopathic doctors that do manipulation that's similar to what we do. Um, I would say generally we're going to be better at it because that's our main training in that. And that's what we do every single day. Um, the other side of it is, is the corrective exercise component of it. And that's what, that's where physical therapists are probably better, generally speaking, because that's kind of their bread and butter. Um, I'm trying to kind of fit the space in between of, you know, I'm not a physical therapist. I don't have all the, the, the facility that they have. Um, but I believe in, in exercise. I've always been active. I think it's very vital to teach people to be again, self-sufficient. Um, but they need help in knowing what to do and how to do it properly, that kind of a thing. Okay. So you touched on something because you said that there is another doctor that's similar and I'm sorry, uh, uh doctor, uh, uh, osteopaths so and osteopaths, what okay. people know as a DO usually after your primary care physician or the surgeon's name, it'll be MD or DO Okay. and DO is doctor of osteopath. Okay. So let me ask you, so how do uh, most chiropractors will put themselves out there as a chiropractor, correct? Mm -hmm. So they're not going to have a doctor of osteopathic, I've probably said that wrong, no, medicine. Um, um, but how can one tell that they're actually going to a chiropractor versus the DO? Most will, will advertise. It'll, it'll say DC after their name. DC. Meaning, yeah. Okay. Or a, considered a doctor of chiropractic. And most people will have chiropractic in their business name, you know, whether it's you know, whether it's Moyle Chiropractic or they'll have some kind of other name, but it'll have chiropractic in the name. Typically. So that way you know. It. But yeah. DC is the designation instead of Correct. DO. Yep. So that was what I was getting at yep. in, in a roundabout way. Yeah, no, I, I was tracking <laughs> with you. And most MDs and DOs now are, it's hard to differentiate, but some DOs learn to manipulate. That's the, that's the wording for the adjust, what most people think of is, is the chiropractic adjustment. Osteopaths learn to do some of that too. And osteopaths and chiropractors used to be very similar, um, but it's kind of the DOs have gone more down the, the medical side of things, I would say. So it's harder to, to differentiate between those two. Okay. Yeah. It is getting harder and harder to find out, you know, the difference between MD and DO and, you know, everything that's out there. So right. it's always nice to know when someone's got a difference. Yeah. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Connecting Tucson with Jamie, where we focus on connecting our community and local businesses. Um, as your local insurance professional for uh, professional and commercial lines insurance needs and a small business owner here in Tucson, I know it's important to make new and lasting connections in our community. You never know when a connection will spark or pull you in a direction where you didn't even think you should go. If you're a small business owner or involved in a community project and you'd like to be featured on the show, please feel free to give me a call. All of my information is on TucsonBusinessRadioX.com and I'd absolutely love to hear from you. 
Today we're talking with Dr. Jason Moyle, who owns his own practice um, here in Tucson. So you've been in Tucson for 16 plus years, but practicing chiropractic medicine in, for 10, correct? Correct. So I find Tucson to be more of a large town with like a small feel. Uh, many of my clients, they just want to get to know me prior to doing business with me. They want to you know, know about my family, how long I've been doing business, okay. um, and just every little nuance about me before they'll actually give me their business. Do you find that to be the same thing um, in your small business or is it completely different because you're more of like a, a service provider with an actual like tangible feel? No, I agree completely. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe that's just my personality. So I draw those types of people too. My parents, my mom and stepdad own a bar for 30 some ah. years in small town Iowa. So we're just kind of used to that, uh, that kind of community feel. So that's feel. where the psyche or psychiatrist comes from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably. Yeah. yeah. It, it is very much like that sometimes, but uh, I mean, our practice has a very kind of laid back feel. I, I, I believe that at least that's what we, that that's what people tell us is, mm -hmm. you know, our staff is very, very friendly. We'd really try to not make it a kind of a sterile, you know, kind of uptight environment, that kind of a thing. You know, I love the chocolate. Yeah. There's chocolate, there's coffee in there. <laughs> um, and I, and I really enjoy getting to know people. So, I mean, and in that process, they get to know me too. You know, I'm, when we're adjusting, there's a lot of time to have conversation, that kind of a thing. Um, so we're always getting to know each other and getting to know, other people's kids and you know what they do and vacations they take and all that kind of stuff so it's definitely a laid-back feel you have a good conversational style mm -hmm. um it does help put people at ease in my my yeah. opinion as yeah. well so yeah I, I just find tucson is a little bit different most places um in big cities i've also worked it's more of a they don't want to get to know you they just want to see you online they're going to do their own yeah. research they're not even going to talk to you right. but here in tucson no they have to talk to you they have to visit with you no, i definitely agree with that and i've never so, lived in a big city so I've, i mean i grew up in a tiny town and like you said tucson is kind of a you know big little town sort of and that's kind of how it is here it's too, big so. little i like that big yeah. little town i like yeah. it so obviously um i find businesses here to have their own unique challenges. What are some challenges that you face day in, day out, either as um, a chiropractic doctor or as a local business owner and entrepreneur? Yeah, I think uh, as a chiropractor, we kind of touched on some of that. You know, there's some misconceptions about chiropractic. So, you know, I'd, when I first started out, you'd get kind of uptight about that kind of stuff and try to get defensive. But I think with most things, once you get a little older, you don't, you know, Why you're not as worried about that kind of stuff. You just, you are who you are. If people get to know you, I think they'll, you know, know that you're not a crazy person, that kind of a thing. <laughs> and then from a business perspective, that's one thing is, is chiropractors, we don't learn much about business. You know, they don't, you get all gung ho about going to chiropractic college and learning and, you know, and then and about that last quarter, you're like, man, what am I going to do after this? You know, and you realize you had know nothing about business. I mean, technically, I guess my mom and stepdad ran a, you know, a bar, I guess, successfully for a number of years, but I didn't pay attention to any, how they did know, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Accounts receivable. What the heck is that kind of stuff? And HR, what? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and all the, the stuff that went into that. So I think like most entrepreneurs, I would say just managing the, all the different hats, you know, I don't know that chiropractic is any different than insurance or whatever in some regards is you got to wear a lot of hats doing it. You know, marketing is not my forte. Luckily my wife has a marketing degree. She's the opposite <laughs> so you of me. lean on her. I see so how that, yeah. Get her advice a lot. Um, but I would say that's the biggest one is just the, the, the time demands of being a husband, a, a father, a, you know, a chiropractor and having to learn business stuff at the same time. So. And I'm sure we're going to touch on that just a little yeah. bit later too. <laughs> so, cause that's one of the things that I have as a small business owner and it is, there's so many different hats, Absolutely. but you're obviously doing something right with your business because you've been thriving. Um, and what sets you apart from other chiropractors and why do you feel that you're so successful? Um, well, I try to just be very honest. I think that's at the heart of it is you got to really be honest with people, especially when they're trusting you with their health, um, being very transparent, being sh very straightforward with them. Our staff, we try to go out of our way. Sometimes they don't like this very much because it can be a pain <laughs> in the butt, like calling insurance companies. <laughs> but we like, try to be adamant about, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, put yourself in that situation. You've been in it where you're confused about your insurance coverage. You have no idea what kind of bill you're going to get. So we try to really go out of our way to make sure they understand what it's going to cost. You know, your insurance does this and it's really not that good a deal. So you're better off doing this other thing, that kind of a thing. So we always give them options there. Um, and then, you know, just, just 
just being honest with people, treating people the way you want them to be treated pretty much is the, I know that's not very fancy, but that's kind of Hey, the, you know, tried and true always right. works is what I say. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. Absolutely. And I do the same thing with my staff. I said, you know, put yourself in a situation if you had an increase, right. you know, what would you want to have your agent do? Would you, you know, want them to reach out to say, here's some options that we can reduce it. And I think that's probably what got through to my staff is that, Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, You know, don't avoid the situation that just makes it worse. They're not trying to make your day bad. They're just, (laughs) they just don't know what's going on. And really it's our job. It's our job to try to help them and guide them and let them know, you know, their options, their choices, if there are some that are out there. And, you know, sometimes we're the bearer of bad news to, you know, there are no options. This yeah. is what you've got. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and we do have to tell them that sometimes. Yeah. You know, I don't like, you know, you always want to have a solution for someone, but sometimes the solution is you got to go to somebody else. You know, I can't help you, that kind of a thing. You know? Exactly. But they appreciate, you know, the on- honesty of that. But I, I absolutely agree on that one 100%. So anyways, you know, I always find with, you know, success as in business as you do, um, there's some learning experiences that come along the way. What would you say is your biggest learning experience when probably opening up your business and becoming an entrepreneur? What was that learning moment for you that you had that either took you a little bit more time to grasp or that you're like, oh, I got to, I got to get this in order to be what I, I want to be. Right. Right. I would say looking back, you know, when you're young, you, I was an associate chiropractor for four years um, with a guy in town here, um, and he was a great guy, great mentor, and I always knew and respected him, but there was also a part of, you know, when you're young and naive and you think you know more than you do, I probably didn't listen to him as much as I should have, you know, I think finding that mentor, and as long as they're good people, good ethical people, you know, they really know what they're talking about, and they've been through some of the battles that you have yet to go through, so I think... (laughs) you know, humbling myself a little bit more when, when you're young. And, and there's a lot that goes into that. You know, you're, you're just trying to get started. You're, you have all kinds of energy, all that kind of stuff. I had little kids at home, you know, so there's some stress there trying to make sure that we could provide for them the best way we possible. So then you start thinking, you know, you can figure things out better, but, and then sometimes you can, but you know, I think generally speaking, it's better to listen to those guys and, and kind of humble yourself a little bit more when it comes to that. And, and I think that just goes for life. Just stay humble and realize you're not ever going to figure it all out, but learn from other people's mistakes. So you don't have to make as many on your own. Hopefully keep your mind open, (laughs) ears open, your mouth should remain shut (laughs) and you should have your ears open more than your mouth is actually open. (laughs) Absolutely, And not being afraid to make mistakes. I think that's what I have struggled with. My wife would say that probably is that, um, overanalyzing things, you know, and instead of taking some action, you know, sometimes I tend to, to overthink things and never pull the trigger on things. But, you know, listening from mentors and taking some time to plan, but then pulling the trigger on it and, and being OK if you're going to make a mistake. And, you know, everybody makes mistakes and that's ultimately the best way we learn. So I think that's something I still struggle with a little bit is is not being afraid to. To, to fail in some ways, you know? And well, true. And I think for you, and, and if you fail and like, I think failing for your business is not being able to help somebody, but I, right. maybe that's not the fail. You're, you're pointing them in a different direction. Um, I think you're, you know, taking that a little bit personally. Mine is the same way. There's some people that I can't help and I have to let them know that right. I can't, yep. but always having people there that I can say, this is who can. Mm-hmm. And knowing that I can count on those people. Yes, absolutely. Um, that being said, you are an entrepreneur and a lot of the listeners here are, you know, wanting to be entrepreneurs or potentially brand new entrepreneurs. And a lot of businesses go out of business in the first one to two years. All right. What would you say to those young entrepreneurs out there just starting out business? What would be some advice that you'd give them? I think finding a mentor for sure, you know, asking questions. And I, I've never found someone to say no if I say, hey, can I take you out to lunch and ask you a few questions, you know? Most people that are good people are are uh, very giving of their time in that way. And then also just reading books. I mean, that's, I love reading books. Um, I'm a big Dave Ramsey proponent. He's big on, you know, getting out of debt, that kind of a thing. He has mm-hmm. a lot of personal finance stuff, but he's also got a book called Entree Leadership that I, it's kind of his playbook of how he runs his business and all that. And he's got a podcast and there's even a coaching program that you can do. I think I've never done that, but, um, but it's, 
he, he's very open with his kind of journey of what he went through and he kind of wrote it down in a book basically. He calls it entree leadership because I think he, the way he describes it is an entrepreneur has, you know, a hundred ideas before he gets to work every day. And I, I a hundred percent agree yeah. on those hundred ideas. Like, Ooh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. Can't do them all though. So exactly. that's the issue is trying to figure out something that works for you. And that's what he's, the leadership side of that is you I'm have a, to balance the two. There's, there's the entrepreneur that's, you know, coming up with all these ideas and, but there's also the leadership side of things where you have to kind of get those ideas in, in actionable formats and all that. I'd say one of the hardest things um, coming to business for myself, just for those listening, was just figuring out the logistics of actually opening up the business. Yeah. Um, and I think having somebody there that was already in business showing me what I needed to apply for versus what I didn't need to apply for probably would have been very helpful at the time. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was more along the lines of, okay, do I need a TPT? tax no i'm not selling a good in services right. so those types of things what kind of licenses do i need do i have to what kind of insurance i already knew the type of insurance that i need obviously but that is just one thing where i struggled with was i knew insurance just like you probably knew chiropractor but i had right. no idea what it took yeah, to run absolutely. a business from yeah. <laughs> i have to be the hr person i have to be the hire i have to be the manager i have to be the person you know to do all the contracts i have to do the payroll it was just like oh my goodness yeah, yeah. it was like eye opening and i think having people to lean on to say what do you use how do you do that is probably not just a mentor in the business but a mentor on how to open a business, you know, right. having, having somebody that's there. And I always tell people, if you're interested in opening a business, give me a call. I'll walk you through some of the, yeah. the horrors and some of the highlights <laughs> that I had. Um, and I'm very open and honest with it. Right. I went through a struggle the first year and a half. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I don't think, I don't think there's a business owner alive that hasn't, you know, struggled with things for sure. Cause it is, it's, it's tough, but you know, if you just, do a little bit every day. And I think being, being willing to pay somebody that knows what they're doing. I, I made the mistake of trying to keep track of my own books like the first year in practice. And Ouch. It's ultimately not, you know, <laughs> you that don't be doing difficult, that. but yeah. yeah, I would not do it for two months, three months. And then I'd be up for, you know, four days straight trying to catch up on stuff. And I think you just have to be willing to, and, and a lot of people are bootstrapping businesses, so they don't have a whole lot of finances to do it. Right. And I think there is a place for, you know, at least being aware of how to do things, but when you can, you know, hire people that know what they're doing and I think find a good it. CPA. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's probably yep. my one biggest thing that I could tell anybody, don't do that yourself, find a CPA. I would agree. My CPA helped me out a lot, like with all the licensing and all that kind of See? stuff. Because I had no idea what any of that stuff was. And he at least walked me through that process. So, That's yeah. always good to have there. Yeah. Um, we, we touched on it, you know, business owners, you're wearing so many hats, you know, it's hard. So I go from manager to owner to agent to HR to contractor to hiring to marketing to social media, all of these different hats that you wear during the day. And it's hard to take all of those hats off at the end of the day when I'm at home. Oh yeah. So work-life balance for me is always, I guess, been a struggle for me. I'm not really good at separating the two. Um, how do you balance your work and family life? And do you have any routines and tips that you can help share um, with our listeners? I try to, you know, once I go home, I try to, to just switch, flip the switch as best I can, which that sounds really simple, but I mean, it is a simple idea. It's not easy to do necessarily. Easier said than done. Yes. Correct. Yep. Sometimes I'm good at it. Sometimes I'm not so good at it, you know, and my wife is pretty good, you know, whether it's just giving me a look or uh, whatever it is, that, you know, and <laughs> that's good enough. At the looks. Yeah, that's typically enough for me to like, okay, I gotta, cause I can be there physically, but she can tell when I'm mentally there or not, you know, if my daughter's talking to me and, and I have that kind of glaze in my eye, that kind of a thing, thinking about things. And I don't ever want to do that, but sometimes you just have stuff on your mind. But she's pretty good about keeping me accountable and, you know, just telling me to snap out of it, that kind of a thing. And I really try to carve out the, that time from when I get home to the when they go to bed. It's I'm not thinking about anything else. Do I always succeed at that? No, necessarily. But then once they're back in bed, if I had to do something and I also get up early, you know, I'm a big the military kind of brainwashed me. I'm up at 430, 445 every single morning. Oh, we should start texting at that early. Yeah. Come on, let's do it. I'm up at like 430, 445, too. 
Some people just don't understand. My wife is not a morning person. She just kind of rolls over and rolls her eyes at me. But My husband's the same way. He's yeah. like, seriously, it's like 4.30. What are you doing? <laughs> just, I'm kind of lucky because I've, I've always, even since high school, I've you know got up. I just liked having my time in the morning to just I relax. find it peaceful yeah. and I can get a lot done yep. in the morning because there's really nothing there. Absolutely. Nothing there. So, well, not only that, I think it gives me time to those hundred ideas that I've got going yeah. on. I'm doing it at that point in time and I can sit there and, you know, write down what I need to get done, what I should get done. And then what I want to get done, my needs, wants and wishes type Absolutely. deal for yeah. the day. And yeah. I make sure my, my needs come first. So, you know, that's, that's out there. Absolutely. So you mentioned um, earlier that your wife is good at marketing, but marketing is a big part of business. What are you doing right now for any type of marketing to help get out there? Well, we actually are trying to rebrand everything right now. Currently I have some, a friend, luckily enough, he's a website guy and he does social media and all that kind of stuff. So I finally have We've been talking about it for such a long time. Remember I going back to me thinking about things for way too long. Um, this one we're finally starting to pull the trigger on. So we're, we're going to kind of redo our website and, and kind of rewrite our, uh, our marketing copy, that kind of a thing to, oh to better portray kind of what we're doing and why we're different, that kind of a thing. Um, I've done some networking groups, which have been good, um, but it's just hard again, going back to the time thing, uh, even though they are effective and I enjoy it. And I still have a lot of relationships with people, you know, 10 years ago when I first did a networking group and I still know a lot of those people. Um, I do, I coach youth basketball and that's not really the purpose of doing that is, is not networking really, but I find that the more natural networking, the just getting to know people in the sports, is, absolutely. is more effective, you know, cause you get to know the parents and whatnot and inevitably, you know, that's one of the first questions that comes up is what do you do? That kind of a thing. And then you just start talking to people about that. Yeah. I start talking to people about what I do. I get that deer in the headlight look. Yeah. They're like, Oh, your insurance. <laughs> people probably think insurance <laughs> is all the same. Right? My wife they did do. insurance. So I, she educated yeah. me on that. She they're, did. They're, they're different types. Trust me. Yeah. Um, so obviously you touched on it, um, coming home and wearing those different hats. There's a lot of stress being a business owner. What do you do to de-stress? Uh, work out. That's probably a big thing for sure. Um, show off. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's part of getting up at four thirty, four forty-five in the morning. And I realize if I don't do that, I'm just a, a more grumpy, less pleasurable person to be around. Less productive sure. too, because exactly, you, yeah. your, your brain's not. Yep. Yeah. And then also, I mean, my faith is a big thing. You know, I, I go to church, you know, and I'm not trying to preach to anybody, but, uh, my faith is pretty important to me. Um, reading, you know, the Bible, going to church, getting to know that's people, great. that kind of a thing. That's, I would say that's up there as far as keeping me level headed and getting the stress off too, as well. I think it's big. Yeah. I do a lot of meditation. Yeah. Um, very good. I don't, I'm not very good at it. Right, right. That's why I do a lot of it. <laughs> but <laughs> I try to, um, since I haven't been able to work out due to my injuries for a yeah. while. But I'm starting to do it again. Really good, excited. Good. So um, we touched we touched about marketing. We touched about staying, um, you know, busy and wearing different hats. I'm. I see a lot of chiropractors out on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, not like literally on the street. <laughs> Hopefully that would be awkward yeah. um, <laughs> coming <laughs> along with that little contraption. Yeah, selling newspapers or whatever. <laughs> no, uh, but there are a lot of chiropractors out there. Um, just like there's a lot of insurance agents and I've got to do things differently to stay competitive and keep the edge on. What do you do to stay competitive in your business? Um, I think uh, the time with patients. Um, our model is definitely spending a little bit more time with patients. We kind of limit our schedule to only seeing so many people per day. Um, that way we can spend more time with them. And then also the the... I touched on it, the corrective exercise component and the extra certifications that I've taken. I think that's, that's pretty rare in the chiropractic world. A lot of physical therapists have those certifications, but not too many chiropractors do. And I just comes from my own personal desire of being hurt and kind of applying what they taught me to myself and realizing it works a lot and being able to help other people with those types of things, like show them the corrective exercises. And most back problems can be effectively managed or even fixed with some kind of stretch or exercise routine of some sort. So I would say that differentiates us more so than, than anything else I would say. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, it's clear you love what you do. You have a lot of passion for it. Um, what do you like best about what you do? I think just getting to know people really. I mean, I think that's Whatever you do, I mean, I think we're ultimately here for other people per se. You know, usually the people that are just living for themselves are, are more miserable I, from my observation. <laughs> so if you're just there, you know, 
focused on your own goals constantly, it, it tends to not go as well, you know, but you're just there kind of having fun with people. You're obviously there being professional, offering a service for people, but um, like we, we were talking about being conversational with people, you know, just kind of getting to know them and on a personal level too. You know, I think that's fun to me. And maybe it comes from being, in the, you know, my parents own in a bar, you know, you just kind of talk to people. And like you said, the psychologist thing, people, people tend to open up, you know, when you're in those situations and, right. you know, everybody wants somebody to talk to. And I think that's what I enjoy the most. And then learning, obviously, I just love learning about the body and I'm always amazed at how the body works. So the nerd has finally come out. Yeah, exactly. So you yeah. Say. It's there. I'm telling you, <laughs> we all got a little bit of nerd in us. So, <laughs> well, I love numbers. So yeah. numbers and insurance. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably a bigger nerd than most people because right. I do a lot of reading and things as, as well. But yeah. I, you know, Hey, I find someone, someone likes to talk about those types of things and mm -hmm. that's me. Absolutely. And not everybody likes to talk about insurance, right. but when they need to use it, mm -hmm. They want to make sure that they've got the correct stuff. Absolutely. So, and I'm there to help them. Now, you actually touched on my last um, question just a second ago about goals. Now, everyone's got goals. What What are your goals to come out of? Um, what Where do you see yourself in five years? Do you have any specific goals that you're striving for? Either be it like new marketing, new connections. What would you like to see happen? Yeah, I think just definitely clarifying my my message. You know, getting better at explaining kind of what I do and where why I'm different, I guess, from most chiropractors, because I really want to be a, you know, a service to the community of, of really helping people understand their problem and giving them long-term solutions to it. You know, I'm, I've always been kind of a do-it-yourselfer kind of guy. So if I, I like to learn stuff that I can apply and really see results, you know, and I think that's where the, the exercise component comes in. Um, so that's my goal is to really effectively have people know that I have their best interest in mind and, really leave the office, you know, feeling better physically and hopefully mentally, but also feeling educated and equipped to be able to, to take care of some things on their own as well when they get into a problem. That is, that is huge. Not only can you help them, but giving them the tools to do it themselves. I highly, highly recommend you. I cannot say that <laughs> more you. than enough. You've, you've been more than helpful for me, you've provided me with some tips and making me to the point where I can move a little yeah. bit more in, flexible. That's important. <laughs> that's important. So for those of you out there that are on the fence, um, I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Jason Moyle is here with us in the office and that is all we have time for uh, with connecting with Tucson with Jamie. Um, if you like the show, please let us know. You can get to know a little bit more about Dr. Jason Moyle and his business by going to TucsonBusinessRadioX.com and click on Connecting Tucson with Jamie. As always, don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and make that new connection. You never know where it's going to lead, do you? Do you? Absolutely. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to come on this podcast this a few months ago, my, did you? On my radar. <laughs> Until next time, keep on making unique connections. Thank you so much, Jason, and everyone have a fabulous day. Thanks for having me.